How, how many of you know St. Peter's? Isn't that incredible? That's incredible. There you go. That's probably about 50-60%. Um, today is a dialogue. It's not... I, I, I know you're sitting there and I'm standing out here. There isn't an artist in the world who doesn't love the sound of their own voice. I don't want this to be a half-hour exercise in ego. If you've got questions, ask them. The whole point of what we're doing, the whole point of public art, and this type of public art is about a long, long-term dialogue between very, very diverse groups of people. And this is the start. There, there's no reason to present the work that I'm going to give to you at this stage unless it's about getting people involved in that long-term discussion. And as many of you know, there's been a whole movement within the art world towards dialogical art. The idea that the conversation, that the point of exchange of ideas can start from the very, very point that an idea occurs, rather than just at the point of product. Um, someone described this way of working as like an iceberg principle. That if you imagine a final presentation, whether it's a performative piece of work, whether it's an actual um, product or an artifact, that what appears above the surface of the water, maybe the few weeks that a piece of work is seen or a performance takes place, the reality of the object is this vast, vast mass that is hidden under the surface. And I think, again, in, in, in public art practice, it's the whole bit that's under the surface that is sustaining the work and is as important. And that means that these dialogues that we have like this actually begin to inform the long-term creative direction a piece of work goes in. So for me, it's not just an, an exercise in, in, in giving you information. It's about a proper and full intellectual engagement with a set of ideas. And what, what we're engaging with today is, is, is St. Peter's Seminary and Kilmahue Woodlands, this incredible uh, built environment, just 17 miles from Glasgow. And uh, the challenge that we've decided to take on to, um, to do something with it, to, to lead it towards its next stage of, of evolution. And um, what I'm going to start with is just to give you a, a short uh, film excerpt uh, from a film by Murray Grigger. Murray's a remarkable um, Scots filmmaker, uh, pr probably moving towards 70 years old now, and he's been very particular in championing uh, architects from across the world over the years in a number of absolutely wonderful documentaries. He was one of the people who championed the Mac when, it, when, when, when Macintosh was completely out of fashion in the 60s, when, when people didn't want to know that he was not respected as a piece of architecture, when you think of it now as a great you know, heritage site now across the world, that was not the case 30, 40 years ago. And Murray um, made a, a wonderful small film uh, in 1972 uh, at the seminary uh, when, it was a, when it was a working building when the young seminarians, the young trainee priests, had just moved into the building. Uh, Thirteen years later, it was closed, and he went back uh, in 2009-10 on a cold, cold uh, wintry week, and with a wonderful uh, cinematographer, Seamus McGarvey, he reshot his film shot for shot, and the two films sit side by side. So what you see is simply the processes of entropy and time as they have affected this particular building. So without more ado, we're going to show just about a five, six minute sequence of the film, and then I'll take you into the actual narrative of St. Peter's. So uh, enjoy. So Murray's film, there's some wonderful stories about that. Uh, the film carries on to to reflect a day in the life of a seminarian. Of course, it all focuses ultimately around the mass. The entire building, the program of the entire building is ultimately to deliver um, the experience of learning mass, the, the, the five fingers that hold the side of the building on either side, like two, two hands uh, that hold the superstructure of the building, are where the young seminarians with their backs to the priest would learn uh, the process of mass. Um, Murray was on a very tight budget and had a very small crew, and when they were filming um, the mass from behind the altar, when he got the shot that he wanted, he, he shouted, cut, 
And with a withering look, the, the head priest looked at him and said, you, you cannot cut in the middle of a mass. And they, they refused to work with him from that point on. And he had one final shot that he required, which required uh, that, that priest to walk down the ceremonial ramp that took them into the sacristy beneath. And he only had three or four crew with him. And the only person he had spare who looked like the priest was the, was the electrician on the show, um, who was a really, really staunch Protestant and Rangers fan. And he had to persuade him to put on the priest's clothes and walk downstairs. And after 10 minutes of heated negotiation, the only way he could get him to do it was when, it, when, it, when he had his Rangers top on underneath. <laughs> it's a classic Scottish story there. Um, the other thing I'll talk about here is that the, we're apt to think of these things, um, the isms, Catholicism, modernism, and forget the real life of the people who were there. And it's really nice that Murray allowed those moments where, where the young guys just sort of spoke for themselves and there's these odd little pockets of conversation throughout the film. Um, in fact, there's a student who used to be here who grew up on uh, who grew up on the estate. His dad was the head gardener. Uh, Peter, you can give me his name. It's Louis. He's up at the back. Ah, oh, Louis. Louis, I have to I have to tell the story uh, of you saying that on a Friday afternoon, a lot of the young priests would come down to his dad's house to put bets on the horses. They'd go out and put the bets on in Helensboro or wherever the, the nearest betting office was, and then listen on the radio and come and pick up the bets if they'd won. It's, it's real life, and that's the beauty of this: is that, is that behind the kind of bigger stories, it's all these wonderful small pieces of social history and often in telling the story I think you have to go into the particularity of that it's as important as the the elegiac ruin or the the effects of, of, of decay over time it's just it's just the transit of human life uh, throughout a space like this but the challenge now and in essence why I'm here is to figure out what, what do you do what do we do with with it the great 20th century building like this and a building that is not loved it's maybe it's maybe there's maybe 10 percent of the people of the people who i've met who look at this building and will come from anywhere in the world to visit it it's close to pilgrimage i mean there are people getting in touch now from uh, an unbelievable range of countries to visit this particular building. It is known across the world. It is held up uh, as, as a great example of late modernism. And yet for every one person like that, there are nine people that we've met who want to put a bomb under the building. I mean, literally, the, the reaction is that violent. They truly, truly hate it. And to me, therein lies its interest. Why do they hate it? What is it about modernism of this period that is so deeply alienating to people? that they cannot see the values or the value that made it and think that those values as a piece of amazing history, as a history of the late 20th century, are worth keeping or are worth exploring uh, in depth. And that, that starting point is a really interesting starting point because you realise that your, your role then as an artist is not in any sense to attempt to convince or to persuade people that they should stop hating it. It's to actually articulate that tension and realize that in, in working with what we would describe as a contested site, that, 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 that therein lies the actual, that the real deep interest and the real deep values that you can inter and bring out to explore. And that, that, had, that, that there is real value in that. So in the long run, you can first see, with the topography, that the way the building sits in the landscape is very, very unusual. The language of modernism, I think, is primarily an urban language in Britain. You do not normally see it juxtaposed into, in this case, uh, uh, what was a, a, a full Victorian gated estate. You can see that the building itself wraps around the baronial house, Kilmahue House, um, it's a sort of U-shape wrapping around the house, and it, it doesn't do it in a gentle way. It really, really hits hard into those buildings. It's like saying the 20th century is here, and it doesn't pay respect to that 19th century form. It really, really butts up against it hard.
again, there's the idea, therefore, that there's a tension, there's an excitement, there's a, there's a sense of, of um, something going on in that juxtaposition that is raw. And it's, an, it's not attempting to be pleasing. And I think, again, that's something that you can work with really well, is that sense of um, just a really unusual starting point for a piece of work. Uh, the landscape itself, it's quite important to understand uh, how things sit within the landscape. And I suppose that's um, perhaps a key to why NVA's approach might work in a way that for the last 28 years, no commercial plan has worked um, to save this particular building. Is that people are apt to obsess about the building itself and not to see the wider, the wider setting and see the value that it is, it is one part of the built environment. And it in fact sits within a 500 year narrative, which starts with, if you look at the top of the map, there's just a small rectangle. And that's Kilmahue Castle, a classic Scottish keep. And in fact, the first uh, path network run along the side of the blue line, which is Kilmahue Burn, which was uh, an, an old uh, drove road that went from Cardross Village up over onto Loch Lomond. Uh, and would have been a place that people moved livestock up and down past that uh, uh, castle keep. That's your first layer of history on this site. Built history. The earlier is the actual formation of the, of, of the glen itself, which is these two converging river lines. Uh, Wollaston Glen that you see on the east and, uh, as I said, Kilmahue on, on the west. And they converge at a point at the, the southern point of the site this wonderful point where the rivers come together. It's a sandstone base and the Gartness Fault, which is a major fault line that runs northwest to southeast coming across onto Loch Lomond, has created uh, two deeply incised burns with some really interesting aggregate rocks running through it. So what you have, of course, is the passage of water over time, which has created these deep gorges, which means that they're steep-sided, which means that there's some really beautiful self-generated oak woodlands, which simply because of the steep sides of the burns have not been cut down. As, as you know, the history of Scotland is one of the decimation of the Caledonian forest. We, we simply were not sustainable um, throughout medieval times. Wood was just used on a vast scale. So that classic image of the Scottish landscape of the sort of bare hills is of course completely man-made. It's a constructed image. That's why it should never be seen as romantic. Because the truth is, we just, we just damaged it beyond degree and you just now have the last remnants of Scott Park, Scott's Pines in parts of uh, Scotland. So in this particular place, it's interesting that it's these dense oak woodlands running down the gorges. And then onto that semi-naturalised landscape came the next layer, which was the establishment of a Victorian estate. And you can see that in three bridges that cross the main burn points and then the lower square represents the walled gardens and then the baronial house as i said was wrapped with the 20th century intervention of the uh, seminary and then there's probably about five or six kilometers of paths that crisscross the estate and to put in that degree of path network within uh, uh, a Victorian estate is unusual because, of course, the history of rural land use in, in, in Scotland, there's been basically two forms. There's been the, the whole scale only on behalf of the, the state, with people like the National Trust, Scottish Natural Heritage, um, the Forestry Commission, owning large bodies of Scotland. And then you have the private landowners. And the private landowners primarily buy that land in order to keep you out. I mean, it's a, it's a classic of Scottish land ownership that these borders are not permeable. They're primarily gated. And if there aren't actual gates there, there are invisible barriers which say you're not welcome here, that this land is not your land. And this was interesting because the, the family who put the original estate together, uh, the Burns family, um, who made the money through Cunard, the big, the big liners that were built down on the Clyde. They were quite, they were quite liberal in the sense that they, they opened their estate up for people to walk and use. 
so quite often they actually allowed the grounds to be accessed. That said, if you walk through these gates into the walled gardens, these would have employed probably upwards of about 14 people. And the provision of food, um, they were very, these walls were heated and they were producing grapes, plums, nectarines, peaches. They were for the family. 14 staff working for one family. And the house itself would originally have had 20 or 30 staff. I think in, in, in the uh, late 19th century, they, had, they employed 68 people uh, to manage the estate, ultimately for the needs of one family. It's incredibly hierarchical uh, reality. And then you have to juxtapose that, and then the institutionalization of this landscape as it became um, owned by the Catholic Church. With their incredible history, um, I went to see Tom Farmer um, in the early days of putting this work together. Tom Farmer owns QuickFit, he's one of the most prom prominent Catholic businessmen in, in Scotland, and I was really interested in, in whether he would support this and whether, whether he would see there was a value in what we were trying to do and, and how to work with the Catholic Church. And he said, there's two things you need to know about them. It's the oldest continual institution in the Western world. In other words, you're dealing with uh, you know, an office that you walk through the doors, and there's a 1,600-year history. So whatever you hear back, you have to understand that they're, they're operating on a time scale that is not going to respond to you saying, well, we've got two years to get planning. They can quite happily sit and say, do you know, we're not, we, we don't find a solution for this site interesting. We're going to hold the land for 50 years for the bishops who come along then. It's a completely different mindset. And the other great challenge that, that he felt that the church had to face was that of celibacy and the fact that the reason why celibacy was introduced into the church was actually not for ideological reasons, but was for the fact that if a priest died and he had a family, the property would accrue to the family. So by making the priest celibate, the property stayed within the church. Deeply pragmatic. And think about the problems that that has made for the church. It's made the church rich, but it's also led to, to I think, a, a deep schism within, within the faith itself um, that they've had to deal with. And the results are still being seen, as you know, with various things that have happened in the last, uh, come to light in the last 40, 50 years. So property is actually at the heart of that. Um, the other thing that is incredible about the Catholic Church is that it was they who were commissioning buildings like this. And that, again, as a, as a piece of social history, as a piece of architectural history, is remarkable. How could a an organization that is that old and seemingly, you know, socially conservative, be responsible for releasing these amazing structures and shapes into the world. And uh, Izzy Metzstein and Andy McMillan, the two architects, you know, who went on to teach at the MAC, uh, and, and who have certainly lately been very celebrated for what they've done, they were atheists. You know, they weren't, they weren't inherent believers and yet they had a deep understanding of how a program could work and how you could use this amazing superstructure to create these voided spaces and then how you could modulate, particularly how you could modulate light and shadow and the way it came into the building in such a way that it would release this incredible um, quality, this numinous quality that still manifests itself amid all the ruination, it still manifests itself in some of those interior spaces. And that is their genius, is the way that they, they actually modulated light and shadow. And it was interesting speaking to some priests who used to um, uh, learn with this in this building, even if they hated the building, and again, I, did, you know, I make no notes about it, they really did hate the building. Many will refer to a particular mass on a Sunday in summer when good light and sunshine was moving uh, into the south, and light was coming down through the roof lights and through the beams into the main chapel space and there was this incredible sense of, 
presence. And of course, to them, the presence of God. To other people, it would just be you know, the presence of natural forces. And that stays with them. So, just give you a quality of how it looked at that point. We got really interested in the idea that procession is central to, to the Catholic Church. And procession is also central to uh, Le Corbusier. And I reference him, of course, as, let's say, a certain father of modernism. It was the idea that buildings are there to be moved through, that they have a sculptural form in their own right. And when you combine that idea of procession, and then Corbusier's sense of movement, and the idea of a walk narrative through a building, that becomes central to the way NBA works which is the idea of intentional movement, not, not just walking through something as a, as a passive spectator, but the idea of moving with intention, moving with a sense of yourself in space, and a deeper awareness, and a deep, deeper capability to observe what is around you, and to, to feel and sense it on an experiential level. So I feel that we're carrying on, in, in our particular way of working, a, a, a link to some of the key things that made this building. <coughs> but going back to that commissioning process, because I kind of skated over that, try and think of ourselves back. It's the 1940s. There's just been this uh, horrific world war, and a lot of young people have witnessed things that they should never witness, and things that many of us will never witness. And they came back, and maybe their faith in the institutions was not the same. They weren't willing to listen to politicians in the same way. They weren't willing to listen to their teachers. You know, the idea we have of rebellion, uh, as most people have grown up with some notion of questioning authority, it's an absolute natural thing from the 60s and 70s onwards. This was the first generation who were really saying, after what we've seen, we're not willing to put up with how things were. And that was a deep, deep questioning of values. And somehow, it, it, it seems that the modernist program said, and this is the, of course the same period that the health service was, was provided for everyone, there was a sense we have to make a better world. And we have to imagine what that world might be. And that can happen within politics and, and uh, policy, but it can also happen in the built environment. That, that sense of sort of building some idea, some ideal of what the world or what society could be and embodying that in stone and concrete and, and the materiality itself. What a, what a wonderful thing, because I don't get a sense that many architects today are getting similar sorts of commissions. I don't get a sense as we, as we go through this, this long recession and continuing war and the ideological problems between different monotheistic faiths, environmental pressure, I don't get a sense that we're thinking about the future in a very positive way just now. These are very, very different times. Therefore, the deep ambition of this work, you know, that sense of expansiveness and just going for it and tackling previous century uh, architecture in this radical way, I find that incredibly refreshing. That's why it continues to inspire. But of course the problem, as everyone knows, is that it sort of didn't work. It didn't work on a practical level. Like, like many things that, that try and imagine the future. The future's got a funny way of just not doing what you want it to do. And in this case, I mean, you know, one of the local councillors that we've been trying to persuade to come on board, who's, who's not, not been very supportive of us, said, oh, Gillespie could cry it, well, you had to go to Mass with a bucket. Catch the raindrops. In other words, their buildings were beautiful, but they never functioned well as, 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 as lived in as, as lived in uh, environments. I think they counted 68 leagues in the first winter in this building. The problem is, of course, when you're experimenting with materials and you're creating lots of shapes um, that um, are, are awkward and are bespoke, you don't have standard finishes. And it's very, very hard in that situation to, um, to keep out the Scottish climate. And here's one of the problems of modernism in Scotland. It's if you take an equivalent building like La Tourette, a beautiful monastery in the south of France, 
the amb ambient temperature that building uh, operates in is probably somewhere between 15 to 30 degrees a year. The average rainfall is, the rainfall is 17 inches. Average rainfall in the west of Scotland, 105 inches. Ambient temperature, 10 to 20 degrees. So this building is getting a real kicking from the Scottish environment. And in some ways, you could argue that, that it, you know, it's just, it's just not designed to cope with that level of impact. But that's what's made, that, that's what's made its current condition. And that is the reality of it. And for the last 20 years, people have tried to come up with very standard regeneration ideas for what you should do with this building. So for example, a hotel, a spa, uh, private housing, where you can use it then as a corridor onto Glasgow and come out and have a sort of perfect life in a rural setting. Very, very standard post thatcherite approaches to regeneration. And the building and the topography have defeated every attempt to do that. And you have to wonder why. And surely that tells us something, and it tells us something about the times we live in, that those approaches are banal and, and actually limiting and limited. And I'm not going to make a political speech, but I will say one thing, that the, the level to which Thatcherite thinking has pervaded the political life of Britain. So that you can you can really you can really whitewash out the the, the, the reality of whether someone's conservative or um, Labour. It doesn't matter. Thatcherite thinking pervades everything, and it pervades local councils who call themselves independent socialist. The, the rest. It's an incredibly reductive. Reality that is driven by profit and profit alone, and the the reality of it's a business-based approach, and everything has to measure itself against those outputs and those realities. And art, of course, because by its nature it is intangible, it deals with complexity, it is messy in its making, it just doesn't fit into that reality. And yet, that is the world that we are being asked to step into, and it's the world that we are being asked to justify ourselves in. And it should not be so, because there are other values, and I absolutely, passionately reject Thatcherism, and I reject the values of the political generation that we've grown up in, because they really, really miss deeper and more profound aspects of life that are of equal or greater value to those things that they put forward as the, as the, as the benchmarks of success. So it seems to me, that the survival of this building has to be rooted in a different ideology, in a different approach. And the inspiration for NVA, uh, and, and we took this out of Venice Biennale two years ago as a debate uh, with, a, with an interesting range of academics and architects and, and thinkers. The starting point for me was the work of Lina Bobardi. She was uh, born in Italy, like her background was Brazilian. <laughs> She ended up making some great work in Brazil in the 70s. And even back then, Lina Bobardi talked about the need for a humble architecture. It's an interesting idea, a humble architecture, because most people know that architects are not famous for being humble. You know, it's, true, it's, it's seen as a kind of arrogant profession, perhaps wrongly, but it is seen as an arrogant profession. This idea of a humble architecture, in the case of St. Peter's and in her approach, says, Accept things in the present condition. So if you accept this building in its present condition, you have to say that the ruination and the effect of, 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 of time on that building has value. And in other words, and this is a massive, massive moment in terms of conservation debate, that turning this back into a perfect restored example of what it was, is absolutely and totally irrelevant. That the ruination has value, that the degradation has value, because it reflects what has happened. It, it, it reflects the failures of modernism. It reflects the, the, the lack of care 
but something incredible happens within that, within the negativity, within the, the, the destruction. There is still an incredible sense of grandeur and the numinous qualities of the building somehow survive in its skeleton structure and in the qualities that still pervade that building, which is why people go there. It's what they feel, it's what they take from it. And it's a great inspiration to make work. It's inspired a lot of good work over the years. So that acceptance of it in its present state is the starting point for, for MBA. So in other words, our idea is born of the recession. It's born of the fact that we don't have money to throw at it. So we thought, what's the least that you can do that would maintain the quality of this building and actually accept that partial restoration or consolidation is a good thing? And when you look at that deeper in the history of conservation, arguments have been raging uh, for, for 200 years about what we should do with the buildings of the past. And we realise, particularly in a, in, a, in a Scottish setting, you know when we wander around um, wider rural landscapes, there are endless castles, and you see them, and mostly they're just left as they are, slightly tumbled down, there's a bit of concrete work has been done to stop a wall falling, but they're basically just consolidated forms, and it seems that there is no problem with treating the past in that way. You just do what you can do to stop it falling down, and you accept that it's the passage of time that's left it in that particular state. But the minute you try and do that with a 20th century building, it's deeply contentious. It's almost like it's too close to us. It's an ex to accept that it shouldn't be something new and shiny is an acceptance of failure. Whereas again, what I feel we're doing is celebrating the complex reasons that made it and accepting what's happened over time and being more humble in how you reuse it. So that it's a restoration project. You only restore what you need. There's an interesting debate happening within architecture just now around embodied energy. And embodied energy says, rather than do a new build, you, in a sense, do what you need to do now, but you accept the amount of energy that went into the building the building originally. And therefore, your energy uses are added on top of that. And that gives it um, a much, a much smaller imprint in terms of cost and use of materials, and that has a real value today. So it's a recycling project on a vast scale. So the actual, what are we going to use this for? And I think that this is, again, quite important, is that I actually, although I'm very passionate about the building and the landscape, um, there's no point in just saving it for its own sake. It has to has, have a function and it has to have a usefulness. And the art that is made there has to have a usefulness. So we defined it as a, as a productive landscape. In a productive landscape, the, the idea is of bringing forth. It means that you both you bring forth knowledge, you bring forth food, you bring forth employment. Real things that have a real value. And the it, see, it seemed really important, for example, that, that food production was equal to the restoring of the building. Because again, unless you're taking control of food production and breaking that consumer cycle, you're wasting having this amazing landscape around the building. So there are certain, there are certain I think, things like that which are worth bringing through. You can see here, uh, this is by Ertz um, Landscape Architects who've led the master plan. Here are the plans for uh, the, the restoration of the walled garden. And actually maintaining a sense of privateness, it's, there's a double layering um, around the walled garden. So we've created a double hedgerow. So you have the sense that you really have to penetrate into it because it is a, one of the beauties for those of you who know the site is the sense that you're discovering it for yourself. You're creating your own narratives as you walk through it. You have to find things. And the idea of creating this perfectly signed open, easy to read landscape, I think would take away from the qualities of, of, of what uh, time and recolonization of trees have done to it. So it's sustaining that character <coughs> while giving you usable facilities at the same time. And our, our, our repurposing 
Our reason to do all of this is to establish um, what we're calling the Invisible College. And the Invisible College is the idea that you do something that is low on infrastructure, but actually carries on the original function of the site, which is a, was as a learning environment. And so we're currently setting up uh, a network of higher education institutions, which in the long run would include the School of Art, Glasgow University, Edinburgh University, Duncan and Jordanson, Grays, Strathclyde, to work together to allow students, professors, academics, postgrads, secondary school kids, and primary school kids to simultaneously access this environment 365 days a year as a kind of open field station. And there's one proviso, which is that you must use the landscape itself as the inspiration for the work. In other words, the buildings, that narrative that I've laid out for you, is the actual starting point for the research. And that research can also simultaneously be led or come from a whole range of academic disciplines. So, how you read this, of course, will depend on what department you're in. So, a social geographer, an anthropologist, a philosopher, an environmental artist, an architect, a landscape architect, a historian, anyone within those specialisms will have a different take on what they are seeing. And as you create this open network and an open way of research evolving that puts those different approaches and different ways of observing and understanding together, you can imagine us building up a body of research where the site is inspiring the work, the site is the subject. And then as part of what we're calling a generative art process, if you imagine that taking place in a winter term and a spring term, every spring, whatever research has been created then feeds a public art commissioning process. So a range of international, national, local, young, younger artists and better established artists we use that research material to create a program of interventions, installations, performances, rituals, public meals, so that the whole process is that the academic research does not get stuck within the institution. It's been, I mean, I don't know, any of you do PhDs and you see them, you do this work for years and then it just somehow disappears. It stays within the institution. And it seems to me that all the good thinking that happens as new generations bring knowledge through, it needs to come out of the institutions and be shared back with the public. Because in 30, 40 years' time, if you have kids, 50% of them will not go to college. They won't go to universities. They won't go to art schools because they will not want to be saddled with 30, 40,000 pounds worth of debt. I mean, the idea that you would take on this level of debt with no job prospect. Why would you do it unless you're getting such an incredible level of teaching and support that it makes those three or four years worthwhile? And again, I won't go into a political rant, but you know what's coming. I grew up in the generation where I was absolutely fully supported to explore what was in my mind aged 18, 19, 20, 21. Now I pay tax, now I'm a, you know, a member of society who puts back in, but that giving to me in the first place by the state, I don't believe I could be here, I don't believe I would have the freedom in my head unless I'd had that freedom not to be in debt, not to be worrying about, about where I was going to be working in two or three years' time. And I believe that that is a right in a civilised society for young people to have free higher education. It's a right! That's why we live in a free society. So the idea that we're sort of, again, because if you are saddled with debt, it, it makes you more conservative. It's very clever. Again, it's Thatcherism with a different mask on. And it seems to me, again, I know this is great because it's so small, we can create, you know, something small and perfect that shares knowledge. It can't work across the whole of society, but at least we can make that effort to create a place where new thinking is shared with the public, with local people, in a continuing dialogue. And I think this is the crucial thing. It's much, for me, much of the work that would be made there would not. It's the, it's the polar opposite of a sculpture park. 
that sets an object in a landscape and time. It's about creating unusual dialogues between, say, artist, student, local farmer, politician, and creating unusual combinations of relationships that then seed ideas for work, where the conversation is part of making the work. So again, that's the idea of an iterative, generative art process, and that's what I hope we move towards. On a very practical level then, all we want to do with the building is to stop the bits falling down that would land on your head, and create a wind and watertight space within the chapel so that you can have a place for lectures, exhibitions, interventions, meals. Uh, I always think food is central. Um, a place to congregate. And so that's the practical thing we, we bring back in the first phase. Maybe we'll put accommodation in there in 10, 15 years time, but the start point is just to make that wind and watertight heart at the center. And I describe that as like a, a heart beating in a skeletal frame. Because the strange thing is that now that all the screening has been ripped away, now that, now that there is no longer a reason to separate sacristy from chapel, from refectory, from uh, student accommodation, now that it just reads as this open form, actually the beauty, the beauty of the architecture takes on a different quality. And actually in its openness, in its rawness, it actually reveals, uh, I, I think, some of the strengths of, of, of that late modernism, the rawness. Uh, the amazing sense of mass and floating form that, that, that is there within, I think, the best of, uh, the best of uh, modernist architecture. So working with Avanti architects who are great modernist restorers, uh, they did the Lubeckin Penguin Walkway in London Zoo. They restored that a few years ago, were well known for that. Um, but working with uh, their restoration techniques, we work very, very carefully through leaving what we want to leave and bringing back what we can. So, that's the challenge. And the church has um, concluded what's called conditional missives with us, which means that they've accepted an offer to buy and the building is off the market, but we have to raise 10 million in order to realize this humble vision. You know, it's 10 million, how humble is that? It's still a lot of money. But if there is a willingness among the funding institutions and the government of Scotland to do it, I think it will be a, a new step in terms of the treatment of architecture in this country and the UK. That use of an intentional ruin and that acceptance, it, it's, a big, it's a big step to take. It's not, uh, you, you'll see models like this, of course, in places like Sao Paulo, in uh, Duisburg Nord, uh, some of you will know the amazing treatment of the old steel and gas works uh, near Dusseldorf. The Matadero in Madrid, which is an amazing reuse of a slaughterhouse. The Neue Museum um, in Berlin. There's a history of, of very, very clever um, reuse, adaption, and intervention across other parts of the world. And yet somehow, in the UK, you sometimes feel we're trapped, we're trapped by our past. That our notion of heritage in this country is sometimes about turning the clock back, rather than heritage as a living, dynamic, fluid form that has to change with time. So that's our challenge, and I hope that some of you will come along with us on the way. Thanks very much for your time.